spoken a good deal about the representation of transgender people in film on this channel already. And due to the positive feedback I have received and my personal investment in the topic, I plan to continue walking this path. It should be said, though, that my opinions on the matter often deviate from the consensus. So too do my opinions on trans activism in general. Much of the dogma commonplace on the internet will prove itself dated, limited, and even problematic in due time. This is definitely true for detransitioners and their place in conversation with transgender activism. A fear-mongering argument that reactionary feminists make is that impressionable people are simply brainwashed into being trans, and they will likely regret undergoing social and medical transitioning, despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Socially and medically transitioning helps many within the transgender community, especially those battling gender dysphoria. As far as those regretting transitioning, well, those numbers are slim, and the reason the majority do regret it is because they experience transphobia on a daily basis regardless. Whether it be within the workplace, in the dating scene, or in the family unit. Other times they don't regret transitioning, but detransition as a result of overwhelming financial obstacles. This is a problem with the culture, and not the trans person navigating said culture. The 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey collected responses of almost 28,000 transgender and gender nonconforming individuals, which included collecting data from people who no longer identify as trans. 8% of those who have transitioned reported having detransitioned at some point. And among these 8%, 62% now live identifying as a gender different to the one assigned to them at birth. I imagine these numbers have fluctuated since, but what we can tell by this data is that detransitioning is often a temporary compromise for a trans person. However, there are indeed people who detransition who now attest they are not and have never actually been truly transgender, even if they once thought that they were. This assertion challenges dogma commonplace within trans activism, especially on social media, because if we are to respect the words of detransitioners and affirm the validity of their gender identity, we must simultaneously accept the often deemed problematic notion that some people who have identified as trans are not actually trans. We must accept that some people can be confused or go through a phase in their lives. As we have established, this is a rare statistical minority within a statistical minority, but D-trans people deserve respect without immediate resistance because they challenge contemporary dogma that trans activists insist upon. I find it rather gross for trans rights activists to treat detransitioners as irrelevant anecdotes for the sake of upholding their essentialist dogma. And I think it is even grosser for transphobes to use detrans people as a prop for promoting their bigoted agenda. I will not be dwelling in the latter group, because I trust the majority of my audience already knows that they are wrong. It's the former group where things get tricky, because I do think they usually mean well. This is not to suggest that one should necessarily reject or even question the legitimacy of someone's transness. No, when met with a situation in which someone reveals himself interested in transitioning, the odds are far more likely that they are indeed transgender. This is even true for children. Generally speaking, a person will know themselves better than anyone else does. However, we should also reject absolutes including the essentialist rhetoric that unfortunately plagues what passes for trans activism. If given a significant reason to question a loved one's gender, one should not be judgmental or have a contrary stance made up. One should talk through with a person and raise potential questions and concerns when appropriate and respectful to do so. It's better to respect their identity, even if it could be subject to change back and forth. What's best is to guide the person in the correct direction, and for them to figure things out for themselves. Now, a detransitioner is not necessarily transgender, or cisgender, or binary, or non-binary. That is all up for the individual to determine for themselves, and then for us to respect. Those who detransition on the basis of not actually being trans still have far more right to their identity than anyone else does.
from here on out, this is the specific type of detransitioner I will be speaking about when I say detrans or detransitioner. For this type tends to not actually be trans, while the others tend to still be trans. Many good faith trans activists succumb to rhetoric that is unfortunately marked by unintentional or unconscious detransphobia. The implications of what they say ignore the validity of detrans people, and continuing to stand by this dogma does nobody any favor. This can easily be seen in popular media criticism on the subject of trans representation. The Silence of the Lambs features a transgender character named Buffalo Bill. She kills overweight women in hopes of making a woman suit to complete her transition. Hannibal Lecter claims that Buffalo Bill is not actually transgender, and all characters misgender Bill throughout the film. I am sure that Renegade Cut means well when insisting that Jame Gum from Silence of the Lambs is a valid trans woman, but by insisting that an individual can never ever be wrong or confused about their perceived transness, not even when they are a psychotic serial killer, is a rather questionable position to take when we consider that there are normal functioning people who come to realize that their status of being transgender is one they no longer trust. Yes, Gum can still be read as trans, and their crimes and mental state do not inherently challenge that. And as I have stated in my video on the subject, I get that the film's assertion that Gum is definitely not trans has a paradoxical potential to be deemed transphobic, because it promotes the all-too-common assumption that trans people are just confused and therefore it does nothing but further stigmatize their social disposition. But if we are to accept the validity of the self-admitted, once confused, detransitioners, then we open a whole new can of worms that I honestly think should be opened. That is, if we truly want to accept everyone within reason. Activists tend to simplify for the sake of clear and concise messages, as if the world itself is simple but it's not, so we shouldn't treat it as such. Whether the film incarnation of Jame Gum is an authentic trans woman or not, it is clear that they are troubled and need psychological help, first and foremost. Gum's status of being, or not being, transgender does warrant analysis, but blindly asserting that they are misgendered despite being closeted, and using pronoun essentialist rhetoric, while ironically calling them the male-coded Buffalo Bill, might not be as productive as it may for a seem. What's most important is to prioritize personhood above gender, even when we are analyzing and writing fictional characters. I think this is exactly what Reiner Werner Fassbender does within his 1978 film, In the Year of Thirteen Men's. He sees his characters as people first, above anything else which makes for a fascinating portrayal of gender nonconformity. For this video study, I'll be examining the role of gender within In the Year of Thirteen Moons and read the protagonist as both trans and detrans, and then explore what the film adds to the conversation about both types of people and their depictions within cinema at large. The main character of In the Year of Thirteen Moons is often described as a trans woman, although the film has enough indication that their gender is not exactly concrete, and they may not be authentically living as the gender that they present themselves as. Thus, I'll be swapping names and pronouns depending on where we are in the story, and through what lens we are viewing this film under. The protagonist was born as Irvin Weishaupt, but adopted the identity of Elvira Weishaupt and medically transitioned. Later on in the film, they return to presenting masculine, and passively accept the names Irvin and Father once again. This is where we reach a crossroad. E. Weishaupt can be read as either trans or detrans. Let's entertain both and see what this film says about gender identity. Es was? Abzeihung, ich hier. Wenn Sie mich noch lange so anschauen, schlachte ich Sie ab. Auf los, ab und bitte Viewing Elvira as an authentic transgender woman 
opens the floodgates for contemporary criticism, largely because the film undermines the legitimacy of her gender through some of its characters and narrative scenarios. Despite this, Fassbender is actually rather subversive. With notable exceptions, Elvira's status as a woman is affirmed throughout the course of the film by those she interacts with. For the most part, they accept her for who she is, a woman. There are a few moments where her loved ones break this affirmation and misgender her, though, to her passive acceptance. For instance, when her ex-wife Irene visits her, she is called Elvira. Kein Unsinn, Elvira! But when the conversation gets personal and concerns the well-being of their daughter, Irene opts to call her by her dead name, Irvin. Less so out of conscious disrespect and more so out of a mutual emotional longing for the past when their lives together as spouses and parents were simpler. <laughs> Elvira and Irene's daughter Marianne continuously genders the protagonist as male often to calling her father, for that is what she has been to her for so long, her father. Irene, Marianne. Papa. Elvira. To be fair, she is only really seen doing so when Elvira is presenting masculine again. At one point in the film, Elvira visits Sister Gudrun, the nun who raised her. It is Elvira who asserts that she is Irvin so that this maternal figure can recognize her. In addition to sacrificing her gender for the sake of returning to religious traditionalism. Ich bin Erwin Weishaupt. Erinnern Sie, erinnern Sie sich an mich? Two monologues, one at the monastery and one at the slaughterhouse, clue the viewer in on why it is that Elvira had transitioned in the first place. According to Sister Gudrun, Elvira had a tendency throughout her life to lie to herself and to others in order to be seen favorably by the nuns. Er lernte dieses System der belohnten Lügen so perfekt beherrschen, dass niemand merkte, wie aus dem leisen Kind ein trauriges wurde. Gudrun implies that Elvira is lying to herself about her gender too, that her identity is invalid. Aber irgendwo unter seiner Schädeldecke hatte es nicht aufgehört zu brennen. Erwin wurde ein anderer. Fassbinder would go so far as to support this too. The slaughterhouse is a contentious metaphor. Elvira and her friend Zora tour this former place of employment, and the viewer is subjected to a brutal documentation of the process of cow slaughter in real time. In addition to the many parallels to the Showa that one could extrapolate from the scene, there is also a blunt insinuation that Elvira's transsexual body has been mutilated like the cattle in front of them. The bodies of animals are in many ways destroyed. The same can be said about this protagonist. Gib mir ein Gott zu sagen, ich, ich, Elvira pursued genital reassignment and social transition, not out of psychological necessity, but instead out of desperation for love, to mold herself into the traditionally recognized feminine form that would be seen as attractive to her love interest, Anton Seitz, who would only return affection if she were what is traditionally accepted as a woman. This, however, does not necessarily indicate that she is not trans. A person can be transgender simply because they identify as such. Yes, there is often a psychological factor that informs a person's decision or desire to present themselves and identify one way or another, but once again, we should reject essentialism. Some people may not have gender dysphoria or an innate necessity to transition, but that does not make them any less trans. Likewise, a person could have gender dysphoria while identifying in a manner assigned to them. Both should be respected. Whether or not Fassbender intends Elvira to be authentically trans or not, one could reasonably read her as such. I've seen a small niche group of trans activist cinephiles criticize the film and postulate that not only does Fassbender not understand trans issues, but Elvira doesn't either. And this is because, according to them, Elvira isn't actually transgender. <laughs> 
he supposedly adopts feminine attributes and lives inauthentically and stereotypically as he sees women. While arguments can be made that Elvira isn't actually trans, the paradoxical problem we are met with in this opposition is that it is ostensibly gatekeeping who is and who isn't actually a woman. Some women, both cis and trans alike, do adopt stereotypical behavioral patterns, whether they be from nature or nurture. So I'm not exactly a fan of dismissing Elvira's transness outright, although it can at least be assumed that the effort to transition from one social identity to another does predominantly stem from an atypical source. Furthermore, the actual result of the transition is not sunshine and rainbows. Elvira descends further and further into depression and self-hatred, leading to the decline of her body and mind. That's not to suggest that it is necessarily the transition itself that has led her to this, but instead the inability to find love and happiness even while navigating in a more ideal state. The film also suggests a spiritual phenomenon of sorts, with the title referencing the theory that in moon years, consisting of 13 new moons, people are more likely to experience personal tragedies. If this depression is indeed predetermined, it would occur in Elvira's life, regardless of her gender. If anything, Elvira's sudden distrust of her womanhood could be a result of depression, rather than the cause of it. This is something that is common in the lives of transgender people. Transitioning is not the end-all, be-all solution to every problem, but can be a solution for many of them. I do not think that the film is suggesting anything contrary to this fact, but perhaps a less charitable reading could connect Elvira's suicide to the cow slaughter and argue that the film suggests that the trans body is far more temporary than others, that the road from transition to death is a logical trajectory. Wenn Sie mich noch lange so anschauen, schlachte ich Sie ab. Ab los, ab mit der Depot. But even if the film is saying this, that does not mean that it is suggesting that this process should be the status quo. But given the gendered expectations society places on individuals, queer people that seek liberation are ultimately met with forces so extreme that they have no choice but to either surrender or die. And if this is the case, art exists as a means to fight against this by highlighting the injustices. People often criticize the existence of queer tragedies, and while they are entitled to their opinion, I'm also entitled to disagree. I'm entitled to my own opinions. The main issue is that sympathetic stories about trans people often reduce them to instruments of pity. So the issue lies within the social imbalance. Although I personally find tragedies more compelling when it comes to dealing with such social issues. I'm inclined to argue that despite its harsh methods of expressing its ideas, and perhaps some dated implications, In a Year of Thirteen Moons ultimately succeeds in this respect. Although gender is not Fassbender's priority with this film, it comes secondary. Above all else, the film is about depression and grief. After all, it was made in response to the suicide of Fassbender's lover. There is also an underlying commentary on the post-fascist landscape of Germany, which I won't get into too much here. And for as politically charged as it may be, the film is also deeply personal. But the focus of my analysis here is the film's treatment of gender. So it is only appropriate to now switch gears and apply an alternative reading of Elvira, or should I say Irvin? Many activists argue that a trans woman should not be played by a cis man, for it not only robs trans actors of a role, but also continues to perpetuate the idea that a trans woman 
is simply a man performing as a woman. The same basic idea also applies to cis women playing trans men. However, the fact that a woman is not cast in the role of E. Weishaupt might actually be the appropriate move here, not simply because the film undermines their womanhood, but instead because they may not be a woman at all. Wahrscheinlich war sie in ihrer Seele schon immer eine Frau. Eben nicht. Das ist es ja gerade. Sie hat einfach so gemacht. One may argue that the idea that Irvin is not actually trans makes him embody the long withstanding trope of the inauthentic trans. This is when a contentious character's transness or gender nonconformity is shielded by the textual defense that they are inauthentic and therefore protected from accusations of transphobia. Ironically enough, this is argued as just that, transphobic, not just because it is seen as an insufficient scapegoat, but also because it sends the harmful message that some trans people might not be legitimate. The recurring defense mechanism may have originated with good intentions, as it dates all the way back to 1960 with Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. The doctor at the end explains to the characters, as well as to the audience, that Norman Bates, dressing like his mother, is a result of a personality disorder and psychological trauma, rather than a personal desire to cross-dress. Why was he dressed like that? He's a transvestite. Uh, not exactly. A man who dresses in women's clothing in order to achieve a sexual change or satisfaction is a transvestite. But in Norman's case, he was simply doing everything possible to keep alive the illusion of his mother being alive. 31 years later, a variation of the same idea is used in The Silence of the Lambs to distinguish Jane Gum from authentic transgender women and therefore avoid the association and potential criticism. There's no correlation in the literature between transsexualism and violence. Transsexuals are very passive. Billy is not a real transsexual, but he thinks he is. He tries to be. He's tried to be a lot of things, I expect. Director Jonathan Demme would later go on to accept criticisms from the queer community as valid. Billy hates his own identity, you see, and he thinks that makes him a transsexual. But his pathology is a thousand times more savage. Or terrifying. In the same way, 13 Moons heavily suggesting Irvin isn't actually trans finds the film in similar waters, right? Well, yes, but not exactly as far as actual impact goes. People who watch Reiner Werner Fassbender films tend to be more politically engaged and artistically literate than the populist audiences that consume Psycho and Silence of the Lambs, and therefore differences in engagement should be addressed accordingly. Beyond maybe leaving sensitive viewers bothered by its cruel bluntness, the actual danger of 13 Moons is minimal at worst. It's debatable with the other aforementioned films, as they have inadvertently lended their hands in molding the negative cultural outlook on transness and gender nonconformity, even if those films aren't exactly about that in the first place. Oh, wait. I am now compelled to challenge the sentiments I just expressed, by first simply acknowledging the existence of detransitioners, who assert that they were wrong about being trans. If we are to take them seriously, we should reassess the ways in which reductive trans activism intersects popular media criticism, and challenge our previously held dogmatic assumptions. If detransitioners are valid, then on what grounds do we stand to say it is wrong to assert a fictional character can be wrong about their trans status? On what grounds do we stand to assert something is transphobic for the reason that it suggests a person can be confused or misguided about their gender? Detrans people being statistical minorities matters not if we are to strive for relative equality, equity, and fairness among all peoples. Thus, we should take detrans people seriously, and in textual analysis, take detrans characters seriously. If James Gum is confused as the text states, perhaps there is some room to take this as a truth but not final call. To assert the suggestion is inherently transphobic is to either ignore the existence of detrans people or to suggest the existence of detrans people is also inherently transphobic. The same can be said for Irvin Weishaupt. Perhaps he embodies not the trans experience, but instead the detrans experience. Well, that is up for detrans people to decide, but let's run with this interpretation of the character. <laughs> 
it really does make sense, especially given the film both begins and ends with him dressed up in traditionally male clothes. He is even beaten by men because of the perceived incongruity between his post-operation genitals and masculine gender expression. In essence, he does detransition, or at least becomes less fixated on maintaining his femininity, opting instead for something more true and familiar to himself. Ich, uh, bin in der letzten Zeit schon öfters in Sachen gegangen. Transitioning didn't do him any favors in the end, as he is left lonely and depressed, transformed by romantic impulses, and it seems to all be for nothing. The slaughterhouse sequence only supports this reading by comparing surgical transition to meat production. In this case, the body is mutilated for the sake of transforming it into a more consumable product. This distinguishes Irvin from true transness due to outlook on the process. Generally speaking, for transgender people, this procedure is not mutilation, but instead affirmation. For a detransitioner, it has a potential to be the other way around. For this reason, among others, I am quite open to accepting the potential for transition body horror in fiction. Trans activists may be compelled to criticize works that frame gender or sexual transformation as a source of horror, for it further stigmatizes gender transition. However, such stories hold the power to dramatize the nature of gender dysphoria as frequently experienced in different ways by both trans and detrans people alike. The Skin I Live In, directed by Pedro Almodovar, depicts a deranged surgeon transforming his cis male prisoner into a replica of his late wife. The source of horror throughout the film is based on gender dysphoria. Vicente must navigate life now as a prisoner, presenting as a gender he does not want to be, and living with new body parts he does not want. Similarly, Sleepaway Camp, directed by Robert Heltzik, depicts a woman raising her nephew Peter under the identity of his late sister Angela. While the sequel deviates by canonizing Angela as a trans woman, the first film heavily suggests that not only are they likely male, but it is the abuse that they face through this feminine identity that causes them to pursue violent liberation. And such abuse includes being assigned this gender. Furthermore, I think if anyone actually defended the depiction of trans people in this movie, I would find that contemptible. Okay, whatever you say, Mildred. Counter-arguments can and should be made through noteworthy textual examples, but the primary source of horror present in these two texts is built less so on the foundation that transness and transitioning is horrific in itself, and more so on the idea that living inauthentically as a gender other than one's own is what is truly horrifying. Often, but far from always, trans and detrans people alike experience this, it's fine to be a man, a woman, trans, non-trans, binary, or non-binary, and so on and so forth, but only if it is true to the actual person's gender. Paradoxically, detransness can be used in fiction as a means to express or affirm the validity of transness, although that is often not the actual intention of such text creators. The ones I have mentioned thus far are dated or controversial, in part due to the insensitivity and vagueness of their messages, but more so due to the limitations of the often non-trans and non-detrans artists telling the story. Reiner Werner Fassbender, for as queer as he may have been, was limited as well. Still, he seems to have relative thoughtfulness and sensitivity that he brings forth to the subject matter for a multitude of personal reasons. For one, if Irvin is meant to be D-trans, Fassbender either consciously or unconsciously implies that it is far from one's genitals that makes someone a man or woman. The Skin I Live In and Sleepaway Camp also make this assertion, or at least one can extrapolate such conclusions. Thirteen Moons in particular counters the classist, transmedicalist perspective that one is not their gender of identification until their genitals are in alignment with traditional perceptions of male and female. In this case, Irvin may realize in the end, even after surgery, 
he still is a man. However, he is also a man whose life is in ruin, which is why he can't bear to look at himself in the mirror. Du schaust dich jetzt an oder ich schlag dir die Zähne. Ich bin mal nicht gesagt. This is comparable to a scene within the controversial film The Crying Game by Neil Jordan, in which the presumably trans character Dill is forced to present as masculine once again and receives a haircut. As she looks in the mirror with teary eyes, she no longer recognizes herself behind this disguise. I don't recognize myself. Narratively speaking, this affirms her femininity to the audience via stark visual contrast. With Any Year of Thirteen Moons, it is arguably the reverse, though there is more room for interpretation. He is forced to look at himself and what he has become, but it is ultimately at odds with who he truly is and wants to be. In this case, he is seen as a woman. When he begins presenting mail again to his family, he is initially laughed at by Irene, for she now views his maleness as performative. <laughs> Whether we are to read E. Weishaupt as male or female, this scene shows that in many cases, people won't and can't ever truly understand what is going on in another person's head. And uh, that's the sad truth of not only reality, but the film's reconstruction of reality. In the end, E. Weishaupt takes their own life, but is surrounded by those they love, who, for the most part, also share that love. In many ways, the film serves as an acceptance of a lover's suicide, as well as a farewell. I can only hope Fassbender reached some level of peace as a result of making this film. In a Year of Thirteen Moons asks us to think empathetically and try to understand others as people and beyond their positions or dispositions within society, and then in turn consider truths about humanity that may be foreign to us. This is what leads me to the final section of the study, in which I'll push for a relatively gender-neutral reading of the film's protagonist. <laughs> Another reading of In a Year of Thirteen Moons is seeing E. Weishaupt as non-binary or gender fluid. This would make them male or female only by identification when neither manhood nor womanhood truly describes their essence. Under this lens, they are trans as they deviate from their birth assigned gender, and detrans as they also deviate from the gender they attempted to transition into. But in this sense, they are not the typical binary trans woman or cis man. Enough textual evidence supports this reading. According to the testimonies of different characters, E is likely not a binary trans woman or at least is very different from a typical one. One could hypothesize that E is a gay or bi man and must escape homophobia, or I guess biphobia, by inauthentically transitioning into a woman. This would match a common straw man narrative by reactionary feminist, as they state that many trans women are actually gay men escaping homophobia by transitioning. But this has little basis in reality. Well, except in Iran, a country that persecutes its LGB population. While trans people are still discriminated against in Iran, transitioning is not only legal, but gay men are sometimes encouraged or forced into sexual reassignment surgery for them to socially live as the opposite gender, as if transitioning is a cure for homosexuality. This is even alluded to in the American film, 
A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, by Iranian-American director Anna Lily Amirpour, who states that the queer character Rockabilly, a gay man in drag, is included in order to comment on the homophobic injustices of Iran. So then, it can be assumed some self-identifying trans women are actually closeted gay men in parts of the world. Although, this is unlikely the case for E, as throughout their time living as a man, they reportedly never once exhibited any homosexual tendencies. <laughs> Therefore, their romantic longing to be with Anton transcends typical recognitions of the character's gender identity and sexual orientation. Falling in love with a man is not something that makes sense for E. Weishaupt, but this love defies all understood logic and social norms, a love that drives a person to make irreversible changes in their life forever. It's also a love that leads to more pain than success. It's an ineffable phenomenon. Have you geliebt? Anton Seitz? Fassbender's 1980 miniseries, Berlin Alexanderplatz, plays with similar ideas. I've once argued that the relationship between Franz and Reinhold is a homoerotic one, although Fassbender actually argued that this relationship is in no way a homosexual one. This is by no means a question of something sexual between two people of the same gender. Franz Bieberkopf and Reinhold are in no way homosexual. No, what exists between Franz and Reinhold is nothing more nor less than a pure love. I'm well aware that the characters are not technically homosexual, but there is a growing tension between the two as men, an internal conflict that climaxes in a metaphorical boxing match only to manifest into something else. They give in to their true desires for one another, which may not exactly be a homosexual desire, but instead a love for another. Though Fassbender having to clarify that also makes sense to me because of how it is expressed. He is aiming for something beyond mere sexual yearning, but he expresses things with queer-coded imagery, inadvertently evoking homoerotic subtext regardless. Franz's gender expression fluctuates in his mind as he dons feminine makeup. Likewise, Reinhold has a homosexual relationship in prison. The two also kiss instead of fight. Velvet Underground's song, Candy Says, which is about a trans woman, plays as Franz finds his lover with Reinhold. Meets her. There's a lot there to dissect, and Fassbender aims to transcend these gender and sexual expressions and limitations to express something larger about the human condition. A love defined not by sexuality and gender, but instead defined by its own purity. I'm gonna watch the bluebirds fly over my shoulder. This abstract type of love is an overwhelming spiritual force that informs individual destinies. I am of the belief that, in a year of 13 moons, is largely encouraging us to see past gender and sex, and embrace this abstract love that eats away, and this humanism, ironically, defined by pain. A person is not to be solely defined by their gender or sex. They are more than mere men and women. Sure, many will passively or actively embrace these binary roles as a means to best express who they are inside, which ought to be respected. But this is not the reality for everyone. Some would describe themselves as falling outside this gender binary. There are a few other notable films that, while limited, depict trans-adjacent behavior and gender nonconformities, while never explicitly pinpointing what gender these subjects are. These titles include M. Butterfly by David Cronenberg and Hedwig and the Angry Inch by John Cameron Mitchell. According to a niche group of trans activist critics, 
these films are dated at best and transphobic at worst because they fail to affirm trans womanhood as womanhood and continue to muddy waters between trans woman and cis man. Why in Beijing opera are women's roles traditionally played by men? I don't know. Most probably a remnant of the reactionary and patriarchal social no. structure. It's because only a man knows how a woman is supposed to act. Trans men are often excluded from conversation because they are often excluded from films, despite them making up about half of the binary trans population. The logic of this critique proves itself limited and quite concerning when we accept the existence of gender identities that fall outside this traditional binary. These films, among others, are intended to open dialogue about gender identity, both inside and outside the binaries. They encourage audiences to challenge their preconceptions about sexual organs being inherent determiners of manhood and womanhood, or anything else for that matter. You still want to me. Even in a suit and a tie. A common goal of The Crying Game in M. Butterfly is to see past social constructs and, in turn, recognize people as themselves, outside of our warped and culturally defined perceptions of them, whether they be political affiliation, nationality, race, or gender. And gender nonconformity is used as a tool to express the limitations of individual perceptions and the hold that traditional conformity has on the cis male outsider. Dill may very well be a trans woman, Song may be very well a gay man, and Hedvig may very well be genderqueer, but all of these stories aid to express an ultimately non-binary or post-gender message, and by extension, an encouragement to accept the validity of individual experiences. This message is very much present within Fassbender's film. This is not to suggest gender itself is fake exactly. Social constructs are constructed in society and therefore exist, even if they are malleable. Identities are adopted to best describe what social groups the individual falls into. Gender identities are to be trusted and respected just as much between cis, trans, and detrans people largely based on their own individual choices of self-identification, informed by a variety of psychological and social factors. D-trans people may challenge some dogma currently in place within trans activism, but that doesn't discredit the core message of trans activism in its broad application to the vast majority of trans-identifying and gender-questioning peoples. In the end, there probably isn't a correct way to read the gender of Elvira or Irvin Weishaupt, as the film paves the way for a variety of interpretations. Upon first viewing, I personally read Elvira as a trans woman, but after revisiting the film, I couldn't help but see Irvin as D-trans. After actually writing the study, I definitely see the argument for both, and while I believe Fassbender was hinting at something that would now be described in English as gender fluid or non-binary, I think I see them as D-trans, but my mind is surely open to change. While I haven't reached a true verdict, and I'm not sure if a true verdict can even be reached, hopefully this video gives you, the viewer, some things to think about whether they be about the film specifically or gender itself. I can't help but suspect that this video study will become dated and limited in due time, hopefully sooner than later. As of the time of this recording, the topic of detransitioners is largely neglected in discourse and definitely within art analysis. For now, I think what's most important is that, within reason, we accept and respect other people's gender identities, even those we distrust.
Furthermore, we should acknowledge the existence and validity of D-trans people and accept them into conversation within and alongside activism. But we should also be cautious. We should accept people for who they are. But in order to do so, we must first show them love. Should I let him continue to wear girls' clothing, or should I put my foot down? If you put your foot down, he'd only go behind closed doors. Love is the only answer. Supposing Glenn never gets over wearing girls' clothing. Would it matter to you very much? I love Glenn. I'll do everything I can to make him happy. Thanks for watching. And special thanks to my patrons Werner Saz, Claire, Yaka Rajanoi, George, Greg, Adam Young, Wolfgang, and Picadon. Please consider subscribing and sharing my work around. Please, please, please. Thank you. Bye bye. Oh, wait.